All right, today's video is going to be a little different, and I want to focus on the word mishkaveh in Leviticus 18.22 and also Leviticus 20, verse 13. And it's important in terms of how do we translate this word? Uh, who's it pertaining to? What's it pertaining to? How's it being used? How are we to interpret it? Now, I've got a video on how to translate Leviticus 18, 22 and Leviticus 20, verse 13. You want to watch that video and discuss how to translate it? I've already done that. You can join the conversation. Click on the links down below in the description if you want to go join that conversation. Today, I'm strictly looking at Mishkave and looking at it, how it's used in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, or what's called the Masoretic Text. And then draw some conclusions and, well, raise some questions and then draw some conclusions. Now, if you like the work that I do on this channel, you know, I'm not perfect. Uh, but I hope you you do enjoy it enough at least to stick around. I would appreciate any support you can provide, including uh, sharing out the videos, sharing out the channel, or go get yourself some merch. Here's a Jesus is Lord hat in Greek. If you want to get one of these, you can get this, a t-shirt, sweatshirt. We've also got Bruka Tadonai. Uh, merchandise as well. So take your pick, grab what you want, show your support, and I would appreciate it. But let's dive in. How is Mishkave used in Leviticus 18.22? So Leviticus 18.22 reads, Ve'eth zachar lo teshachav mishkave isha. I won't read the rest. We're concerned with Mishkave. And that's what the Masoretic text says. The Septuagint says K meta arsenos u kimithisi kitin ginakus or ginakos rather. So the main verb is tishkav, which is cal imperfect second masculine singular, you will lie down. Now it's uh, negated with lo, so you will not lie down, but the main verb is tishkav. The Septuagint is kimithisi, which is passive. The Hebrew is not passive. But uh, the, the Greek Septuagint is. Well, that's okay. Uh, Liddell Scott Jones mentions that this verb, which is kimao, when in the middle or passive, basically is active in meaning. Uh, so it's translated with an active rendering. Uh, it also mentions that it's a, uh, that's a, it's a specific kind of uh, accusative where it's an accusative cognate to the verb. So the verb is shikhav, and the accusative cognate is mishkave. You can hear it in Hebrew. Uh, and it's true in Greek as well. So kimithisi, which is kimao, and kitin, or kiti, okay? These are cognate uh, words, both the verb and the noun. This is going to be important for our later discussion, so table that for now. But our, our main word is mishkave, and it is a construct. It's plural, but it is a construct. Mishkave isha. Mishkave means bed or marriage bed. As a construct, we're going to add of and then isha, woman. So bed of a woman or bed of a wife. The Septuagint reads similarly, kitin ginekos. Uh, so bed of a woman, okay, or bed of a wife. Now, mishkav occurs 44 times in the Masoretic text. That's a lot, but rarely is it used as a construct, and rarely does it mean something along the lines of to copulate, to have sex with, to lie down with for sex. Uh, usually, it just simply means bed or couch something you lie down upon. In those cases, it is singular. However, in three instances, is it uh, plural? And in those three instances, the Septuagint renders it singular, kitin, rather than uh, kitas. So, uh, interestingly enough, the 
idea is singular. And we know this in TDOT, the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. Uh, it calls to light that this word, mishkav, when in the plural, is pointing towards act rather than place. So whenever you see it in the plural, it's pointing to an action, the act, which is lovemaking, uh, sexual intercourse, rather than the place, the bed. So we see it Genesis 49, verse 4, we see it in Leviticus 18, 22, and we see it in Leviticus uh, 20, verse 13. Now, as for Genesis 49, verse 4, uh, Mishkave uh, Avicha, so the bed of your father. Uh, and it's in reference to uh, his secondary wife. And the Greek is Ketin to Patros Su, the bed of your father. So we know contextually that's incestuous by the later Levitical law because technically they're not related, right? It's not his actual mother. It's essentially, I guess, in modern terminology, we would say stepmother. But notice Mish Mishkav is translated again by Ketin. Okay, so Keti. There are other uh, parallels, but uh, they're not exactly congruent with what we're dealing with in Leviticus. Uh, it does... Uh, it is important at least to see that in Numbers 31, uh, 31, 17, 18, and 35, you have the opposite parallel, okay? If Leviticus has a uh, bed of a woman, Numbers, as well as Judges, has bed of a male. So it's the opposite. And it is... Uh, in reference to women. So women who have not known a man, Ish, uh, by uh, the bed of a male. So it's the antonym to our situation in Leviticus. And that's the euphemism. The euphemism is to have sexual relations. They They, they say to sleep with, to bed, a man or a woman, a male or a woman. So that's what we're working with. It's 44 occurrences overall, but really it's just three. And of the three, really it's just two when it comes to the specific idea of bedding a woman. If we look at the opposite, bedding a man, that occurs twice. Uh, it occurs in Judges 21 and, and again in uh, Numbers 31. No matter wh whether it's in reference to a man or a woman, clearly sexual relationships are in view. Does Leviticus 18.22 actually prohibit same-sex relationships? Now, Leviticus 18.22, and when I say Leviticus 18.22, I also mean 20 verse 13. It's been said that it's been used as a weapon against all same-sex relationships. It's true. It, it kind of has. It has. I agree with that statement. Leviticus 18 and, and 20, uh, for that matter, are only prohibiting male-to-male same-sex relationships. You can't work around that. That's the facts. That's what the text says. But are English translations misinterpreting Leviticus 18.22? Now, if English translators are interpreting it or translating it incorrectly, I don't, I don't agree with that idea. So I've seen the argument that the helping word as is not meant to be there or with, etc. And I'm, I'm painting in broad strokes here. That's just not true. That's just not true. It's said that he is supposed to be there to make the comparison. And while that would customarily be true, it's not the only way. Not only that, uh, Mishkave being the direct object, well, that is true. F is the preposition in this case. We know that because it is not definite. It's not followed by the article. It's not followed by a noun uh, in the absolute. 
that has uh, a proper name or that has the uh, pronominal suffixes. If it doesn't have the article, pronominal suffix, or proper noun, it's not definite. If it's not definite, it's not the definite direct object marker. Therefore, it is F with the position. So the sentence is, you will not lie down with a male. Now, in Hebrew, it can take an accusative noun that is similar, it's linked to, it's related to the verb. That's exactly what we have here. And then furthermore, that being the case, it is a accusative cognate. And as Walt Key O'Connor puts it in their Hebrew grammar, such cognates can function comparatively. That is, you would include as. So if you treat it literally, you will not bed a male bedding a woman or bedding of a woman. We're going to smooth it out with the comparative use. And that's totally appropriate to do because it is a cognate accusative or an accusative cognate. So you will not bed a male as bed of a, of a woman. So that's a very literal, rough translation, but it's totally appropriate. It's not illegitimate. This has nothing to do with deviancy, at least as far as I'm treating it. I can't speak for others. This has everything to do with syntax, and that's it. Is Leviticus 18.22 just simply prohibiting male-to-male -male incestuous rape? Conclusions that look at the syntax and say, well, it's missing chi, and uh, it, it, can't, it can't mean as. Conclusions that ultimately arrive at, especially by looking at the context, that this is involving incestuous male-male relationships, I think it's just far-fetched. I think, I think it's trying to skirt the issue. And we, we just need to treat it straightforwardly. Yes, I agree. Leviticus 18 is not dealing with all same-sex relationships. It's not. It's only dealing with male-male. But in how it addresses male-male sexual relationships, it is unequivocally opposed. Period. End of story. There's no way around it. The argument just simply does not hold true that the, the syntax and, and the context points toward incestuous male-male relationship or specifically rape. It doesn't. The reason why we know that is the punishment for rape is death for the person doing the rape. But if you look at 20 verse 13, both parties are put to death. If it were rape, both parties could not be put to death. Just the one doing the raping. We know this. It's consistent. Dinah's uh, not put to death in Genesis 34. Uh, Tamar's not put to death in 2 Samuel 13. In Deuteronomy, uh, you have the adulterous woman. Yeah, she's put to death. But the one who they can't prove it was adultery, and they assume it's rape and giving her the benefit of the doubt, uh, this would be the woman who's betrothed. She's not put to death. Only the man is. And then consequently, the man who rapes a virgin who's not betrothed, he must marry her, pay the higher bride price, and take her as his wife forever without ever divorcing her. So he's punished. She's not. But my point is, since we know in, in 20 verse 13 that both parties are put to death, this can't be rape. So in short, the biblical view of all same-sex relationships is not solved with Leviticus 18 or 20. These verses only address one part of that aspect, and that is male-to-male -male sexual intercourse. However, arguments made to explain away the Leviticus injunctions against male-to-male -male sexual intercourse attempts to effectively pigeonhole it or limit it only to rape or incest, it doesn't do it justice. It doesn't hold water. I've checked numerous commentaries. No one addresses it differently than I. I've checked the, the not only commentaries, but translation manuals. They don't address it any differently. I even checked the JPS. 
the Jerusalem standard for Jewish translation in English. It translates it similar to, similarly to the way I do. I know I'm in good standing. So let me know in the comments below, have you found a source that says otherwise? If so, list the author for me and the title and I'll check it out. If you found this video helpful, hit the like button and we'll see you next time.